Hold up. What's up, beautiful people? Today we're gonna to take a look at the federal courts for your government, AP government course needs. No matter which book you are using, we got you covered, so let's get started. First, we need to take a look at the nature of the judicial system. And it's important to note, the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review. Make sure you know that term. And this means they can check the power of other branches of government and or state governments. And so in short, the Supreme Court can declare laws constitutional or unconstitutional. A little bit more on that a little bit later. If you are taking AP Gov, this is straight out of the framework, the foundation for powers of the judicial branch and how its independence checks the power of other institutions and state governments are set forth in. And there's a couple of foundational documents you should know about. If you take a look at Article 3 of the Constitution, it states the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So basically Article 3 is where you get the setup of the judicial branch. Another document you should know about is Federalist Paper Number 78. This is written by your boy Alexander Hamilton in 1788. And in this essay, Hamilton discusses the power of an independent judiciary. You should definitely take a closer look at this essay, but in short, he talks about the design of the judicial branch protects the Supreme Court's independence as a branch of government. And Hamilton argues in it for life tenure of judges to shield them from the pressure by an overly powerful executive or legislative branch. And another foundation of the powers of the judicial branch can be seen in the case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803. And this established the principle of judicial review, empowering the Supreme Court to nullify an act of the legislative or executive branch that violates the Constitution. So more about that judicial review, ruling things constitutional or unconstitutional. Make sure you know about your Marbury versus Madison. It is interesting to note that there is lots of power held within the judicial branch and you should note there are two basic types of cases. One is criminal and this is when government charges somebody with violating the law. The other type of case you will see is a civil case and this is a dispute between two private parties and this could be an individual, an organization, a group, a company um, and this is dealing with a whole range of issues, everything from contracts to divorces to child custody and usually the punishment if found guilty in a civil case is going to be money. You can't be sent to prison since the case is not being brought about by the government. So criminal cases are the only ones in which you can actually be sent to jail. So stay out of that criminal court kiddos. Now in terms of participants in the judicial system the plaintiff is the one making the accusation and the court determines the plaintiff has a standing to sue and standing to sue means the plaintiff must be an injured party and are directly involved so you can't bring a suit on behalf of somebody else the other side is the defendant you don't want to be this person this is the one being sued or accused of a crime now another term you should know about is amicus curiae this means friend of the court in latin and these briefs can be filed by people or groups who are not a party in a case so they're not the plaintiff they're not to defend it and the point of these briefs is to help or hopefully influence the decision and it allows groups especially interest groups to express their point of view on an issue in a case in which they are not a party now it's important we take a look at the structure of the federal judicial system you know most of the time we just think about the supreme court and article 3 in the constitution established the supreme court but it left to congress as we've seen uh, the ability to create the other federal courts when you're thinking about the federal court system, it basically looks like this. And what you have is one district courts, and these district courts are typically the court of original jurisdiction. Not always, but most of the time. So they don't hear appeals, but what it means by the court of original jurisdiction is the first court that hears a case. And what they do at the district court level is they determine the facts of the case. So this is where you will have a trial with testimony and evidence being presented and whoever loses in this type of case can appeal the decision of the court of original jurisdiction, which means then it would go to a court of appeals or the circuit courts. 
Now, not all appeals will be heard, but appellate courts preside over cases on appeal from the lower courts. Now, appellate courts do not review the facts of the case. They only review any legal issues. So they have appellate jurisdiction. And what that means is they are not there to re-examine the facts of the case, to hear testimony. They can only examine if a lower court made a mistake interpreting the law and interpreting some sort of legal procedure. They're not looking at new evidence, new facts. So at the appellate court level, you're looking at if there was an error of law not of facts finally you have the Supreme Court which is the last stop once you get to the Supreme Court there's nowhere else you can go after that with all this being said most legal activity takes place in the state courts not in the federal judicial system so now that you know the basics of the court system what are the politics of judicial selection? In other words, how do you get judges? Now, federal judicial appointments are nominated by the president, whoever's in office, and subject to Senate confirmation. And this is a hugely important idea because it allows the president, whether it be a Democrat or Republican, to have an impact well past their term in office. And the reason for this is due to the fact federal judges serve for life unless they are impeached and this is extremely rare which means these judges these appointed judges have a lot of influence over american politics vacancies especially at the supreme court level are very few and far between and some presidents for instance jimmy carter never even got to fill a seat on the supreme court whereas donald trump has already filled two seats and barack obama also filled two seats now, unfortunately, the era of divided government has made the process of judicial selection very contentious. If you need any proof of that, see Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, who never even got a hearing from the Republican-controlled Senate when Barack Obama nominated him to the Supreme Court. And with these nominees, especially Supreme Court nominees, you will see interest groups very active in the process, oftentimes lobbying for or against candidates who support or oppose their ideology. So this process of selecting judges has become very partisan. Now, once a judge is nominated to the Supreme Court, the Senate Judiciary Committee holds a tremendous amount of power in the Supreme Court confirmation process. And you can see over there on that graphic, the process as it's supposed to play out. They do conduct hearings. And at these hearings, you will see members of the committee asking questions about their judicial philosophy. And, and your boy Merrick Garland never got a chance to have his hearing, but we saw with President Trump's nominee, Mr. Brett Kavanaugh, that hearing became very contentious as well. As a result of this era of divided government, these nominations have become highly political and the nomination process has become longer and more and more partisan. Once the nominee gets past the committee, there is debate on the Senate floor. And in the past, if the president's party had fewer than 60 seats, the opposition party could try to filibuster the nominee and try to prevent the confirmation process from moving forward. Now, the rules have changed recently, changed it, the vote, the confirmation vote, to a simple majority to end a Democratic filibuster of President Trump's nominee, Neil Gorsuch. All that is needed now is a simple majority, 51 votes, if you can get it. This probably won't be too shocking, but the background of justices have historically not been representative of the American population. Historically, they've been largely white male from the upper economic classes. Now, over the last couple of decades, there has been an effort to diversify the court. So we've seen more women be appointed, uh, more people of color, but regardless of party, Democrat or Republican, very often the main factor in selecting judicial nominees has been like-minded ideology. So Democratic presidents have tended to nominate individuals with more liberal leanings, whereas Republicans tend to nominate more conservative individuals. Now, regardless of what the nominating president wants, their nominee can disappoint them and go in a direction different than they anticipated. So for instance, Anthony Kennedy, who was nominated by a Republican president, he tended to be the swing vote on the court for many years, where sometimes he would side with the liberals, sometimes he would side with the conservatives. And this created a big firestorm when he announced his retirement, therefore giving Donald Trump an opportunity to name a second judge to the court. He had already nominated Neil Gorsuch and he was serving on the court and he tends to vote with the conservative bloc, but 
Kennedy being the swing voter, now Trump was able to nominate an individual who many feel will swing the court further to the right. So now that we know the process for getting on the court, let's talk a little bit about the court itself. It is the highest court in the land. Tons of stuff ends up here, and whatever the Supreme Court says, they have final say. So everything from conflict between states to federal versus state laws and interpreting the Constitution, that gets handled by the Supreme Court. The composition of the court, currently nine justices are on the Supreme Court. You have eight associate judges and one chief justice. And I say there are currently nine because Congress does have the ability to change the number of justices, but it has been at nine since 1869, so most likely it ain't changing anytime soon. Each justice has a team of clerks who assist them as they serve out their duties as a judge on the Supreme Court. Cases before the court. The Supreme Court is unique in that they control their docket. They control which cases they will hear, and they hear about 80 cases per year. Now, to put that in perspective, though, they get anywhere between eight to 10,000 requests. So as you could see, the chances of actually getting your case heard by the Supreme Court is very difficult. It only takes four justices to want to hear a case. This is called the rule of four. If four of the judges, when reviewing the details, want to proceed, the Supreme Court will then take up that case. Now, once the court has decided to hear a case, there's a couple of things that take place. Uh, before oral arguments, justices read legal briefs submitted by attorneys on both sides. They also read those friend of the court briefs submitted by interest groups or those who want to get their opinion heard, and then they hear oral arguments. During the oral argument phase, the justices can interrupt and ask questions. It's a very tense and grueling process. And after that process is complete, the justices privately discuss the case and ultimately vote. And then we have a decision. Speaking of a decision, usually there are two sides to a Supreme Court decision. And this is oftentimes referred to as the majority opinion or minority opinion. Now I say usually because the exception would be a unanimous decision. And that means all nine judges rule the same way. So in that case, there would not be a minority opinion. What happens with these opinions is each side has a justice write an opinion that provides an explanation of the ruling or decision that was made. It's a detailed legal reasoning as to why they reached the decision they did. And so the majority opinion has the most support and its decision takes effect. So to have a majority opinion, you need to get at least five justices to agree. Those are my sick math skills at work right there. Five out of nine is a majority. And this decision, this majority opinion has the rule of law. The winning side's opinion will serve as a guide for future court cases. Now there also is typically a minority or dissenting opinion. And this is the legal argument of the losing side. This can be, this minority opinion can be referenced in future legal cases, but it does not have the rule of law, but you get some rationale as to why the other judges disagreed with the majority. Sometimes you'll have a concurring opinion where a justice may agree with the outcome, but they may have a different legal reasoning than the majority. So a justice will write their opinion and talk about how they reached the conclusion they did with regard to the facts of the case. Now, a quick little freak out mode. If you are taking AP Gov, hit pause. These are the cases you must know. You should definitely know the majority opinion, the minority opinion, kind of the background to these cases. These are the bad boys that you will be tested on. And if you're not in AP Gov, well, know them if you need them. Now, a little bit more about that majority opinion. Precedence and stereodesis play an important role in judicial decision making. Now, that quote is straight from the College Board curriculum for AP government, so let's break this down. The majority opinion establishes a precedent. And what this means is decisions made by higher courts, in this case the Supreme Court, establish the legal standard for similar cases moving forward. So whatever a decision a court makes and the legal reasoning for it establishes this precedent in all cases from that point forward. And these previous judgments must be followed by all courts dealing with similar issues in the future. Now it'd be nice if it was that clear cut, but it's not. Lower courts must follow the legal ruling, but the Supreme Court can overturn a precedent from a prior Supreme Court decision. So you're not bound by a legal decision forever. The Supreme Court can revisit it 
and ultimately reverse its own previous precedents. And the best example of this would be, remember what Brown v. Board of Education did in 1954, it overturned the previous Supreme Court case of Plessy v. Ferguson. So precedents are very important, but they can be overturned by future Supreme Court decisions. In our legal system, it is the belief that precedent should not be casually overturned. It is believed that we must have stability in the law, which leads us to the concept of steridesis, which is Latin for the decision stance. And this is the principle of respecting precedent. Now, boys and girls, you know we live in complicated times and ideological shifts in the makeup of the Supreme Court have led to the courts establishing new or rejecting existing precedent. Different presidential appointments can shift the balance of the court from liberal to conservative, and most argue the court is shifting recently in a more conservative direction. So this issue of rejecting or accepting existing precedent comes up very often during confirmation hearings for judges. Democratic senators will oftentimes ask a conservative judge their feelings about Roe v. Wade, and Republican senators will oftentimes ask more liberal judges their opinions regarding mandated health insurance or Obamacare. So both sides are trying to gauge whether or not a judicial nominee likes certain precedents and determine if they would be willing to overturn them. Now, real quick history of the courts and public policy. So make sure you know some highlights of John Marshall Court, Marbury versus Madison. There's a bunch of cases under Marshall Court, McCullough versus Maryland, Gibbons versus Ogden. Take a look at those. But the big theme is this increase in the power of the federal government. Another significant moment in the Supreme Court history is during the New Deal. Remember, many New Deal programs were ruled unconstitutional by the more conservative Supreme Court, things like the Agricultural Adjustment Act and the National Recovery Act. And FDR came up with his court packing plan, which called for an increase in the number of justices on the Supreme Court. And Roosevelt's goal was he wanted liberal judges that might rule in favor of New Deal policies. Now, this plan was ultimately rejected by Congress, including Democrats condemning this kind of so-called court packing plan. But what you see after World War II is very often the court is going to hear about cases dealing with personal liberties and social equality. And a very important period during the Supreme Court's history is during Earl Warren. During this time, you have a dramatic increase in individual rights and civil liberties. You know, one of Earl Warren's first cases was the Brown v. Board of Education decision, which was one of those rare unanimous decisions handed down by the court. But there's a lot of cases, some of which you need to know on that list that expanded the rights of those accused of a crime, expanded civil liberties, and conservative individuals are typically not big fans of this period in Supreme Court history. Now there is the Burger Court, Earl Warren retires in 1969, and this period Nixon, Richard Nixon, appointed a new conservative Chief Justice, Chief Justice Berger. So this is oftentimes seen as the court moving in a more conservative direction. And even though this was the case, there's still cases like Roe v. Wade under the Berger court, but the court is shifting a little bit more to the right. Now, more recently, especially since 1980, there has been more of a conservative tilt on the Supreme Court. Now, even though the court has moved in a more conservative direction, once again, there has not been a complete reversal of previous civil liberties and civil rights protections, although there have been some. So the court still tries to respect precedent and the court, once again, is not supposed to be involved in all sorts of partisan issues, but they're supposed to just uphold the law. Speaking of which, the basis of decisions gets complicated because justices often disagree on how to interpret the Constitution. These words like due process, equal protection, bare arms, these words are ambiguous. You know, what is an unreasonable search? What does due process look like in action? What does it mean to be able to bear arms? And one's interpretation of the Constitution is very often done by applying our own values to a particular situation. So that's why we have you know, this idea of more liberal or conservative judges because individuals approach cases with their own value system in place. Now, there are some terms to kind of talk about. One of them is originalism, and this is the belief that the court should interpret the Constitution 
as it was originally written. So people who favor this view want individuals to do literally what the words in the Constitution say to do and as the framers intended. Typically, this view is held by some conservatives who do not like the broadening of power of the federal government and the role of the courts in allowing this to happen. And they believe if you want to change the Constitution, you must follow the amendment process that is outlined in Article 5. Now, an opposite view is known as the living Constitution view, and this is the belief that the words in the Constitution must be understood within the context of the times and they have a dynamic meaning. So we must reinterpret the Constitution as times change. The world is way different than it was in the 1780s and 1790s. We have political parties. That wasn't mentioned in the Constitution. We got Instagram. We got Snapchat. We got weapons that can kill a ton of people in less than 30 seconds. And so this view of the Constitution says we must interpret using our own modern context. Now, regardless of the decision, what about implementing those decisions? And hopefully you are aware the judicial branch does not implement or enforce their decisions. This is the role of the executive and the legislative branches. We have seen through history that sometimes the decisions are not enforced. A great example is most of the South refused to integrate after the Brown v. Board of Education decision in 1954. We had to have troops being sent in by the federal government in places like Little Rock, and even then there was widespread resistance to the decision in Brown v. Board of Education. Since the Brown decision and Roe v. Wade and other controversial decisions, these decisions that are controversial or unpopular have led to questions among some about the court's legitimacy and power. Big idea, understanding the courts. You know, there is growing debate in this country around the question, are the courts too powerful? Some express concern that unelected judges have so much power in a democracy and this idea of lifetime tenure with the power of judicial review is really dangerous and it would be better served if elected officials would make changes and policies. So some individuals question the power and legitimacy of the court. On the other hand, others argue that the framers did set up the court to be protected from the majority and the Constitution takes numerous steps to protect minorities from the tyranny of the majority. And so it's important for the court to be insulated from the majority opinion so that they can interpret the law fairly. And this political discussion about the Supreme Court and its power is illustrated best by the ongoing debate over these two terms. Judicial restraint is this idea that the courts should defer to the democratically elected legislatures. In this view, the court should uphold laws, adhere to precedent, and not deliver precedent-setting opinions on big issues such as health care or abortion. On the flip side is this idea of judicial activism, and this is the belief the court should play a large role in protecting the rights of the minority, and this means on occasion making decisions that may not be aligned perfectly with public opinion, but protect the rights of those individuals under the Constitution. So these are two ideas about the power of the court that you should be aware of. Now don't think that the Supreme Court is without restrictions. There are restrictions on the Supreme Court. Make sure you know about some examples that the court can be restricted. That's going to do it. Make sure you check out apushexplained.com and if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to Joe's Productions. Thank you for watching. Click like and have a beautiful day. Peace.